Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, April 9th, and this is the weekly market update. The disclaimer, anything that you hear or see on this video or podcast is not to be taken as investment advice. I am not a licensed financial advisor. I cannot give you individual financial advice. If I give any type of company names or talk about what I'm doing, that's what I'm doing. That doesn't necessarily mean that's what you should be doing. Please do your own due diligence. Consult your financial advisor before making any investments. It's your money. It's your responsibility. Uh, Before I get going, um, I just want to say that uh, I appreciate the um, comments. We get a lot of great comments. We get a lot of good interaction um, in the video comment section. Appreciate that. Appreciate the likes. Appreciate people sharing the uh, video. I've got uh, several emails, many emails, where people have told me that uh, they share the videos. Um, And uh, so I do appreciate that. You know, we're trying to propagate this message. We're trying to get the word out. A lot of people have said that... um, They can't understand why the viewership isn't higher. They can't understand why more people aren't listening to this. Um, Look, this is a very niche message. I do not, I try not to do a lot of um, over the top promotions or try to, you know, buy this sector. It's going to go up a thousand percent in a month, that kind of garbage. I don't, I'm not into that. What I'm trying to do is be fact-based and talk about the news and talk about these markets that we're involved in. In that, uh, you know, tell this story that we've been telling for three years, which is, you know, we look for these sectors that are bombed out, um, that have the ability or have a um, catalyst for a re-rating. You know, basically, as we've distilled it down to before, something that's really, you know, bombed out or crappy or has a lot of bad uh, negativity around it, but that's going from total, you know, total crap to less bad. And just that slight change in perception, as we said before, in the market can lead to extraordinary gains. And typically, that's going to take us, you know, into some cyclical type things or situations that are bombed out. Um, We're very eclectic here in the speculations that we do when we are speculating. I want to make that clear. We do a lot of speculations. There's a few investments we talk about in the newsletter that are longer term and they've done well. We bought them when they were cheap or when there was some for selling type situations. And uh, we've done well with those, but the majority of things we're doing are speculations. So what we're doing is taking advantage of um, the dearth in information, let's say around a certain country or a certain resource market or a company, something that you know people have the wrong perception on. And this is where we make our money. This is our advantage. That's our first advantage. Our second advantage is is that we have unlimited time. Well, relative. Uh, We can wait. You know, if you're running a fund, a hedge fund or a pension fund, you have people that you have to answer to. You have uh, investment boards or a boss and, you know, clients and things like this that are expecting you to deliver. And if you deliver subpar returns, um, you will not be long for that job. And so that causes a lot of herd mentality, right? And a herd thinking. So we have the ability like uranium, for example, I like to always go back to that. You know, we were talking about this three years ago, whenever we started the channel, and, you know, nothing really happened for a long time. Um, and people get bored, and but we 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 had a thesis. It's the correct thesis. It's now playing out, and that has resulted in a lot of the shares that we were able to buy three or four years ago for basically, you know, a dime. Some of these things are up a thousand percent now, and so um, I'm going to talk some more about uranium this week because uh, there's a lot of news, a lot of good news coming out, and looks like you know we're in a full blown bull market. We have been for a while, but I'll talk about that later. But I want to talk about, you know, the thinking that goes behind this. This isn't just random, okay? And for you guys that have been with me for a long time, you know the history, you know what's going on. Um, And, you know, in order to do this and be successful at it, which we've been successful, I mean, you have to have 
correct analysis and clear thinking and judgment. And I go back to, you know, what Charlie Munger says, you know, it's not like I'm some super smart guy or genius. It's like, like I said, in my bio before my website got screwed up, I wrote in my bio, you know, I didn't have a lot of success or my success was hit and miss if I did have it in a, in a given investment year. And then I started realizing, look, if you want to, if you want to be successful at something, go find the person that, <clears throat> excuse me, or the persons that are the most successful in the thing that you want to be successful in and try to glean from them their knowledge. I mean, this is not like rocket science. There's no reason to try to relearn these things yourself. And so I started looking at, you know, these famous successful investors throughout history, not just Munger and Buffett, but I mean, I, I read a book recently about Hetty Green. She was a woman that was uh, in the early 1900s, late 1800s and 1900s. And she was uh, known as the witch of Wall Street. Uh, she really wasn't that bad of a person, but uh, she came from, it's a long story. But anyway, she was a very wealthy woman, very frugal. And uh, she was one of the top investors of her time. And what I keep finding throughout, you know, this history is, you know, you have to have a thesis, you have to have a philosophy around investing. Mine is look for things that are cheap and undervalued. And you're not, you know, I have no advantage of buying if I'm trying to analyze Costco or Apple or Google or Amazon, because there's, that's where all the, you know, big money is. And it's been analyzed, reanalyzed, parsed, taken apart. Like I said, you know, I've told that story before, you know, people that are doing analysis of these retailers, they, they fly drones over the parking lots at different times to try to figure out the traffic patterns, to try to figure out, you know, how many people are going into the store. We don't do that here. We, we look for things that are blown up and we say, let me dig through this rubble, okay, and see if there's any diamond in here or if there's a, you know, something of value here. And that's usually small market caps or places where the big money can't play and won't play. And so that's the advantage. So I, I wanted to quote Munger here because he says something interesting that uh, I think is appropriate. Just because other people agree or disagree with you doesn't make you right or wrong. The only thing that matters is the correctness of your analysis and judgment. That's exactly right. You know, we've been talking about in the last few weeks, the situation that's going on in Eastern Europe with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And again, people come with their biases and their emotion. I don't care what you think. It doesn't matter what I think. What is the reality on the ground? Listen, you want my view on the world? My view on the world is that every politician, every leader of some country is a sociopath. I've said that many times. That includes Vladimir Putin, Zelensky, Biden, Macron, all of them. They are all sociopaths. They're bed bugs. They're damaged psyches. Okay. They want power, more power, more power, more wealth. Okay. That's what all these people are about. It doesn't matter, though, what I think about that. It doesn't matter what the history of this incursion is. It matters is, is what's happening, okay? And what are the knock-on effects? And that, what's that going to lead to down the road? You know, when you play chess and you, and you read about people that play chess successfully, they're, they're, their ability to analyze moves ahead, okay? Um, where they can, you make a move and they can say already in their mind, because they're so skilled and so they have this ability to process the information, they already know within eight, you know, so many moves ahead, how they're going to put you in a checkmate. Okay. This is what we're trying to do here. I know I'm, that's, that's a little bit, you know, simplistic, I know, but that's what we're trying to do here. It doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter, you know, what my opinion is. What matters is, is the correctness of the analysis and the judgment. And so, yes, all humans, including myself, are biased, okay? We have views, okay? If we let views come into our mind, you know, if we're building a bridge, it's a mathematical and engineering exercise. And if I allow biases to come in and say, well, I don't agree with what I was taught, or I don't agree with what the, what the calculator, my scientific calculator is saying on this calculation for the concrete or whatever, and I'm going to make it two plus two equals five, the bridge may fall down. You know, two plus two equals four. It doesn't equal five because I think it should. Now, I was going to use some current examples from current events to show the incorrect thinking that goes on in the world. And if you think like that, I'm not going to do that, though, because it's provocative and it just stirs up and distracts from 
the investment message. But if you have incorrect thinking going on, and you can't, it's very hard to compartmentalize that. If you have a, a habit of thinking incorrectly or allowing biases or what you think should happen come into your thinking, it's going to spill over into investing and speculating. And you have to constantly fight it. You have to, con you know, I don't care if, you know, when I was um, talking about, you know, buying oil or oil, uh, some of these things a year and a half, two years ago, and that people would, you know, no one was watching this thing. No one cared. Okay. Now we have everybody, you know, getting into these things. Okay. It doesn't matter that there's a bunch of people getting in. It matters. Do I think that the thesis of the declining production and supply based on years of underinvestment, is it continuing? Is it going to continue? Okay. Or is it being rectified at this price level? So do I have to change my thinking? That's what matters. And so what happens is, is a lot of people, like I said, they, you have to, uh, I'm going to stress this again, you have to take time out of your life. I don't know how you're going to do it. If you go to the gym, take walks, sit in a quiet room, you need to read and think and ponder these things. Okay. And, you know, why am I committing funds to this particular speculation or investment? What is my thought process? Okay. It's not, it can't be because somebody on the internet said so. You're not going to be successful that way. And it doesn't matter if you're the only one that thinks that. If your analysis, if, you know, when we, when we were talking about uranium three years ago on the internet, four years ago, whenever, when we first started dabbling here, no one was talking about this, you know? And there was a few people and uh, that was it. And then as things become more popular, more people come into it and that's fine. That, that, that's what's going to happen. But because more people are coming into the market, it doesn't mean that I'm right because they're in it, okay? It only matters, is the thesis and then analysis that was done still valid? It was valid then, is it still valid? If it's still valid, then I can continue to add to the positions or hold my positions, okay? If the thinking or if the correctness and the analysis changes, then we have to change our views, okay? And so that's what we're trying to do here. And if you're not able to do that, if you want to, you know, react with emotion to every decision you're making in your life, that's going to have the ability. I'm not saying you're going to be Dr. Spock and everything's going to be, able, everybody has biases. Everybody has emotional responses. Certain things anger you, make you happy, make you sad, whatever. But then you have to say, okay, I'm committing real money here for real life goals, taking care of my family, putting kids through college, trying to buy a house, trying to get to retirement. And if you're going to let emotion rule that, I mean, I don't, you can't be successful. So I think this is important. Again, you know, the correctness of your analysis really does matter. And uh, I think that uh, people need to, uh, you know, really ponder that and, uh, you know, come to a, you know, what I think is a lot of people don't have a philosophical anchor. They have, you know, they go to school, they go to college, so they get a little philosophy, they may have um, some religious exposure when they were a child or in their adulthood, and they have all these things floating around, but they never sit down and say, what is it that I actually, how do I think? Do I have a process for thinking through? I mean, I don't hardly know anybody that, I, I had not done that until recently. I'm talking about in the last five years and sat down and thought to myself, this is how my thought process, this is how I'm going to, my decision tree I'm going to make in general collect the information, um, different points of view. And like I've talked about before in another video, maybe over a year ago, you know, when you're going into battle in a battle plan, you know, you do these war gaming, you know, I'm a student of history and I like to play war games on historical maps and try to, you know, try different scenarios to see what would have happened. What if this would have been done? What if that would have been done? Um, and things like that. And it gives you, you know, it, it's called in it, it, with, with, when they do these war games, of professional militaries, it's, you know, it's called red teaming, right? So you, you're the blue team and then you have the red team or vice versa. And then you, you have people play the other side and try to, you know, use out of the box thinking or whatever to try to challenge your plan. And that's what you need to do when you come up with plans uh, in all facets of your life, if you want to be successful in my view, but uh, you know, we see a lot here, you know, 
we get out to a lot of people and we're trying to um, expand our reach. And, you know, some of the things that we say here bother people and that's just how it's going to be. But that just because somebody doesn't agree or dis or agrees with me or disagrees with me, it's not going to change my analysis. I'm just giving you my analysis, my views. I'm just a guy on the internet. You can choose to listen to them and disregard them. You can choose to listen to them and say you agree with some of them. You may agree with all of them. This is the, how the world works. So that's what I do. I take in information and uh, from all types of people, people that I don't agree with uh, and people I do agree with, and then I make my analysis and then I continue to revisit that analysis to see if it's correct or not. And if it's not, then, uh, you, then you have to be able to change. So the correctness of the analysis matters. Very important, especially when you're dealing with money. All right, let's get into this week's news items. So the uh, European Union, the Euro European, uh, what do they call it? Uh, I don't know, it's not the Congress, the Parliament, European Parliament. They voted in a resolution this week, 513 votes to 22 with 19 abstentions on Thursday. MEPs call for additional punitive measures on Russia, including, quote, an immediate full embargo on Russian imports of oil, coal, nuclear fuel and gas, unquote. And so we've already seen uh, individual countries in Europe, um, like Germany banned coal this week, I think from Russia. I mean, it's hard to keep up because it's every day it's something new, right? And so um, this is an example of what I'm talking about. <clears throat> you very well could believe, might believe, you're within your right to believe that you, we should sanction these, uh, the Russians, we should do this. But the goal here is to understand what's going to happen when we do that. You know, the European Union tied itself, a large part of the European, tied itself for Russia for its energy because of the proximity, the volumes that could be delivered, and the, the pricing. And so that took years, right, to put into place. And so if you're going to have this, um, this view that we're just going to have an embargo, there is going to be effects. And we have talked about that. Now, that may be a price that everybody's willing to pay, but do, you, do we know the full pricing? You know, we talked about it last week. The CEO of BASF, the world's largest chemical company, said that if you cut the natural gas off from um, Russia, uh, he'll, it'll put the German economy into disarray. He'll have to lay off people, tens of thousands of people. And that may be the price that the European people are willing to pay. And that's fine, but you know, we're trying to look at this as what are the knock-on effects going to be? What are going to be, what are the implications for um, allocating capital, okay? Um, you certainly don't wanna be invested in those companies um, or invested in Europe if they're just basically gonna shut the fuel off. You know, we've said this all along. It's humorous to me, I find it amusing, is that most people really don't know what's going on. They don't. You know, when I, when I call like Ursula van der Leyen and all these people, Olaf Scholz and these people, you know, I've, I've gotten, you know, I've gotten um, emails from people and messages, you know, how dare you? These people are our leaders. I'll say whatever I want. And they are stupid. Let me define what stupid is. Stupid is the inability. It doesn't mean you're not educated. It doesn't mean you're not have high intelligence. My definition of stupid is very simple. It is the inability to see cause and effect, okay? And that's what I see when I see something like this. I see a bunch of people that are reacting emotionally that haven't thought through the consequences. So do, you know, if you have tied yourself, you know, if it was only two or 3% of your fuel in, inputs into your, into your countries in Europe, then it wouldn't, you know, then it's easy to get over. But if you think this thing through, you're going to throw yourself into a massive economic um, dislocation. You're going to have severe recessions or depressions. And has this been thought through? This is, a, this is very interesting if they do this and they may feel that that's on a moral level, that's what they need to do. But have they counted the cost? Has the cost been counted and put in front of everybody? the 450 million people in the European Union. I have not seen that. I see a lot of emotional responses. And these people are very highly educated. They, but the problem is they swim in the same pond 
and they have no um, they have no street smarts in my view. And so you know you have business and you have labor and you have other people telling them don't you need to be careful with what you're doing here because you're getting ready to throw this econ these economies into massive dislocations, dislocations that they may not recover from. And that might be hyper, people would say, well, it, you know, if, if fuel needs to go up, if, if gasoline needs to go up 20% or food costs need to go up 20%, then we're willing to pay that. But is that as far as they're gonna go? We don't, you know, if, if you, if, you know, if you have a country like Austria that imports 100% of its natural gas from Russia, what are, do the people of Austria know that? Are they, do they understand what that means if they don't have it? And we know for a fact from the analysis that people have done, maybe the European Commission hasn't done, but a lot of other people have done, that it's all, it's all good and well to say you're going to replace these fuel sources, but you can't do it in a year or two years. It takes, it's going to take years to do this. And I would suggest to you something else. You're not going to have to wait a couple of years because the con several contracts, many of the contracts that from Gazprom are coming up this autumn and fall, and they're not going to, re or the uh, summer and fall, they're not going to renew them with Europe. I talked about it last week. You're seeing the dissolution of the unipolar Anglo-American Atlantist world is, you know, what they call, what the Atlantists, the US and the UK uh, call the post-World War II neoliberal rules-based order. That's going away. We're going into a multipolar world now. And a lot of people don't want to hear that. They don't like it. They don't want to hear it. They're pro-European. They've bought in the, you know, the, the, the rules-based order. The, the, but that's not the way the rest of the world looks at it. And it was interesting, the vote that was taken at the UN to sanction Russia um, was not the same as the one that was taken at the European Union. Uh, more countries voted against sanctioning Russia or abstained, okay? And that was very important to see the ones that voted in the one of, against it and the ones that abstained, okay? And so this, you have to look at the knock-on effects, what's gonna happen? And I find it curious, they kind of left themselves an off-ramp here in this next quote, the Europeans did. This should be accompanied by a plan to ensure the UN, U, EU security of energy supply, as well as a strategy to quote, roll back sanctions in case Russia takes steps towards restoring Ukraine's independence, sovereignty, territorial integrity within its internationally recognized borders and completely removes its troops from the territory of Ukraine. So if you do what we want you to do, we'll let you sell gas to us. Um, and right now, I mean, based on some of the statistics I saw, you know, the ruble now is at an alt is at a recent 52 week high. You know, that was the plan, right? We were, they were going to sanction them. There was going, the ruble was going to collapse. There was going to be hyperinflation in Russia. The economy was going to collapse. And this was going to force the removal of the current Putin regime. And they're going to replace, be replaced by somebody that was more amenable to what the um, Atlantists and the Davos folks wanted. And that didn't happen. And so we're going to keep amping this up. We're going to keep ramping it up. So the goal and the work that we do here at Actionable Intelligence is that's fine. That's what they said they're going to do. We want to understand what the repercussions of that are so that we can, because we're positioned in all of these fuels through our investments and our speculations. And how is that going to affect it? Well, it's going to make them go up is what it's going to do. So that's what we're trying to do here. So this is very interesting. So what we're going to continue to see, in my view, is that, um, and this is my view, and people are going to criticize me. I was wrong on the timeline. I didn't think that this was going to go on this long. The, um, you know, I'm not, uh, I, I, I was uh, wrong in my timeline, so I'm not going to give timelines, but um, I don't see the Russians stopping doing what they're doing till they accomplish their goals. And I'm not going to go over the goals again because I've stated them already. And all you have to do is listen to Lavrov and Putin because they constantly state what their goals are. OK, so they're going to continue because they're pot committed. OK, they're pot committed and they cannot come off this. I mean, the other day, uh, Peskov, who's the uh, press secretary there, um, he was kind of taught, you know, there's different factions. <laughs> People don't understand this. It's humorous also. That's like, well, Vladimir Putin is Russia. He's not. 
He's actually in Russia, in the Russian government, a moderate. He's considered a moderate, okay? For years, he was reaching out, trying to become part of the West, okay? Be more European, okay? And it didn't work for various reasons, which we don't have time to get into. But there are hardliners in Russia. So if Putin goes away, there are people that say that Russia is not going hard enough, that this thing of going in and not, not using the artillery and the full air power to really, you know, if you want to know what the Russians are capable of, look at the pictures and the history. There's YouTube videos of both Chechen wars, okay, and what they did to cities in Chechnya, okay? That's what the Russian military is based around. Go to a city. The, the, these combat brigades are based on artillery and uh, rocket artillery. Go there, be able to contain the area, create a static line, and have the artillery pound the other positions into dust and then roll in. That's They're not doing that. Okay, So this is taking longer, but they're continuing. They're pot committed. They cannot come off this. And now the Russian people are behind them. The polls coming out of there, the the the, the, the discussions, the the um, information that I'm listening to from other folks that have contacts there in academia and in government and in the intelligentsia and the in the uh, uh, political class in Russia, even people that were against this originally, they're pot committed now. They're in this because you know basically what they have perceived, whether it's correct or not, in Russia, these these folks is that the West hates us. And so why, why would we want to, you know, and, and it may be, you may say to yourself, well, of course we hate you because you're invading Ukraine and committing atrocities or whatever uh, the propaganda is, okay? But that's not how they perceive it. So we have to look at ways, look at things for the way they are, okay? So what is what are they going to achieve? And the problem here in the West is the West, are, is the Western democracies, is the EU and the United States government pot committed? Because the Russians are all in on this. And you have a problem here is that it looks like you have a small group of neocons uh, that are dragging us. And, and as, as Alexander Marikoris said from the Duran, these neocons have no reverse gear. If something, their plan is not working, they don't back off and say they were wrong or try to try to fix this. They, they just keep amping up. So we're going to put more weapons in. We're going to put, uh, and when that doesn't work, there's going to be calls, you know, we're going to, the propaganda is being ramped up. So we, you know, somebody needs to do something. We've seen this playbook before, all these atrocities, which I'm not going to get into that, just, you know, litigating that on here. Okay. And so we have to have a no fly zone. So if you have a no fly zone, now you're, now you're at war with Russia. Does Europe want to be at war with Russia? Does the United States, the Pentagon doesn't want to be at war with Russia and either does the European, uh, some of, most of the European elites. But there's a small group of neocons that seem to be dragging us into this. And in the meantime, all you're doing is killing off the best of the Ukrainian people. They're young men. They're irreplaceable. Millions have left the country. What is, you know, what is the final solution here that the Europeans that are, that, that are not allowing Zelensky to, uh, you know, there, there, there's a story that Olaf Scholz, two weeks before this thing started, told Zelensky in private at that, um, I think it was in um, Munich or wherever it was, I think that, that defense meeting that Europe had, you're not going to be allowed to join the NATO. All he, all Schultz and Macron had to do was come out and tell the world, we're not going to allow Ukraine to become part of NATO. He was told that privately. And so now what, what is the plan here? What is the plan what is the Ukrainian leadership doing? What is the EU doing? We're going to have more import, uh, ban more. They've sanctioned. There's no more sanctions. So the sanctions, all you're doing is sanctioning yourself because all of these necessities that you're trying to have an embargo on, you need. And they're not, you can't just easily replace them in a week or two or a month or two or a year or two. That's my point. Some people call, now I'm going to get it in the comments, right? Uh, your apologist, your propaganda. I'm just telling you how this looks. This, you can't, there's not enough LNG. You don't have the terminals in Europe and there's not enough on the oceans to supply and replace. That's the problem. And so if you're just going to shut down and, and have a full embargo, I'm, I'm thinking that that's probably going to cost Europe more than it's going to cost Russia. That's my point. And so let's get uh, into this now. You know, one of the theses that we had for um, 
higher oil prices, record oil prices, which I think we're eventually going to have. I just don't know the timing. You know, we've pulled back recently, had the spike to $130 a barrel on the invasion. We've pulled back. We had a lot of tourists come in, a lot of hot money, and it looks like it's coming back out. But um, this is, these are the things you need to focus on is this type of thing. This is very important. One of the things we've been saying and other folks have been saying that are smarter than us is that OPEC does not have the spare capacity that everybody thinks. And that the don't worry about it, you know, if shale doesn't ramp back up or if investment doesn't come back, don't worry about it because OPEC has, you know, three to five million or seven million barrels of whatever the, the IEA was saying, whatever OPEC was saying before. So here is a rev re revelation that I think is very interesting. So Nigerian Minister of Energy um, or State Minister of Petroleum Resources, a guy that would know, he basically came out this week and said, OPEC does not have capacity to boost produ production. This is, this is exactly what we were waiting for as a catalyst for, very, for higher oil prices. The view that as the recoveries happened um, around the world post uh, the disease that could not be mentioned, that there wasn't going to be sufficient supply. Okay. And this is one of the reasons that we thought that OPEC didn't really have the spare capacity that people thought they did. And so I'll put links to these articles whether necessary, where I have linked it in the show notes. If you're interested, you can peruse that. I always try to put links when I can so that you can look at this information yourself and make your own decisions and, and to keep me square that I'm not uh, you know, just interpreting it the way I want to interpret it. But anyways, from the article. The Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries is not in favor of high crude prices, but it does not have any extra capacity to boost production, according to Nigeria's State Minister for Petroleum Resources. Quote, it is not something that you can go open a tap for at this point. You must have the additional capacity, the idle capacity to bring on, but it takes a lot of work and a lot of investment, honk, honk, for it to have additional production, unquote. Well, that's what we haven't done though, right? We've been almost, I don't know, going on five, six, seven years with underinvestment. And so it hasn't happened. You know, depletion's a, a, a hill that you have to climb. These are depleting assets. Extractive industries are depleting and you have to have constant reinvestment. We haven't had that. We've been preaching from this sermon for two years. And now we have an OPEC minister a minister from one of the major exporters in OPEC, Nigeria, saying there is no capacity to boost production. And this is what we thought would be, as this becomes more mainstream, this realization, you know, we're in a current pullback and I think an ongoing oil bull market, because why? Well, you've got the lockdown going on in Shanghai, right? They're locking down a city of 20 million people, okay? because uh, China has this bizarre zero COVID policy where they just lock the entire place down. Uh, so that's affecting demand. You have that combined with uh, these releases of oil uh, by the SPR, which are, you know, they get, we've talked about that before. I'm not going to go into before the, you know, we're draining the SPR and other countries are chipping in. So that has a, a short-term effect on dampening uh, the rallies. But longer term, that's not a solution. And now you're being told here, you know, that um, they don't have the capacity. I mean, the only thing that stops, in my view, record oil prices later this year or into next year is if we get into a worldwide uh, recession slash depression, which is actually possible now because we have central banks now raising rates into what it looks like, you know, to try to deal with this inflation that they created. I mean, I mean, this is just getting bizarre. I could go off on a commentary for, for an hour about this. You know, if you haven't figured it out, I mean, there'll be people here that don't get it because they're not capable. You know, I want to use this analogy. I'm going to, I don't know if you went to an amusement park when you're a kid or to a county fair, but they used to have, like, before you get on the ride, they used to have these, like a clown, right? It'd be like four feet tall or three and a half feet tall. And you'd have a little sign that said, you must be this tall to, to uh, ride this ride. So if you were taller than the little clown cutout or whatever they had there, you could ride the ride. A lot of people that are investing or watching these videos or whatever, you're not tall enough for this ride. You're not getting it, okay? Now, most of the people that come here, the people that have been with me a long time, you get it, okay? This is it, you know? And so the only thing that takes us off the rails here 
is, you know, these people created the problem, okay, by locking everybody down, destroying the world economy. So they're going to react to that. The lockdowns no, now we know don't work. So what do they do to compensate? Printed trillions and trillions and trillions of currency units, which are now flowing around, which is causing inflation because too much money chasing too few goods leads to inflation. OK, now we're being told, well, we don't have enough spare capacity because, you know, to, to meet the demand for a product that enables commerce, agriculture and life. And so we have prices exploding. And so I'm going to get into and show you these governments just continue to make bad decisions and compound them. And some people are not tall enough for the ride and don't get it, can't comprehend it. They, there's people, there's 30 40% of the people in the world that think the government's here to help them. It's going to come down and kiss their life and make it better. Okay. And they react negatively when you point that out, when you point out the emperor has no clothes, that these people are there for their benefit and to get reelected. And they are causing misery, poverty, and all kinds of problems. You know, most people just want to live their life. Okay. And not, you know, and here's what we get. And so you're being told now that OPEC doesn't have any spare capacity. So the only way this doesn't turn into $200 a barrel oil is if we have this massive ramp up in investment, which isn't happening. We are seeing increased investment, but it's not the ramp up that we need to see. And probably a recession slash depression that's sufficient to cut demand. But in the end, you still don't get the investment. So at some point, you still end up at that high price. So... Going on, um, he says, quote, if there is anything we can do to produce more, OPEC will be the first to produce more. But unfortunately, this capacity doesn't exist in most OPEC countries. There you go. So here we are. Um, this is now happening as we predicted. And this was before the shenanigans and the, the deal in Ukraine when exports of fertilizer and food from Russia were, were um, banned. This is US food price index going back to 1990. So this tracks the uh, price of food. Look, since just since the COVID outbreak, you know, COVID or the disease that cannot be mentioned because of the lockdowns, dislocated agriculture, dislocated a lot of industries, most industries. And that's why you're seeing shipping costs through the roof, manufacturing shortages of supplies, all kinds, this whole thing's just screwed up by these people. And so here's what you have, right? And now it's being exacerbated by this, um, in these embargoes and, and, and high natural gas prices, which cause shutdown of nitrogen plants, which is a major input for row crops. And so you're seeing, I wanna point something out here, you're seeing now this war, Planting is not going to happen in certain areas of Ukraine. I mean, we don't even know all the knock-on effects, but we're starting to see it. So if you go back here to 2011, I pointed this out before. This was the food price level when you had the so-called Arab Spring, which led to all the dislocations. You know, one of the things the Europeans may want to consider is that a lot of uh, Middle Eastern, North African, and Sub-Saharan African countries rely on these grain exports from Russia and Ukraine, which aren't going to happen this year. So I'm curious what they're going to do when, I mean, is it possible? I don't know what's going to happen, but if people don't have food and they begin to starve, what are they going to do about that? Are they going to accept 5, 10, 20 million refugees? Because people are not just going to sit around and shrivel up and dry up and go away. Are we going to create, you know, there's 100, over 100 million people in Egypt. There's not going to be sufficient grain. They have to import wheat. Okay. And we're, we are going parabolic on the food prices. We're, and I'm going to show you later on, we've already started the unrest. The unrest has already started. You know, wait till we get into the summer months in Europe when the costs are, have blown up and the, the, the protest season in France starts. I mean, you have an election this Sunday in France. And a couple months ago, Macron had a 20 point lead on Marine Le Pen, who's, I don't know what her party front national, whatever they're calling it now. Okay. It's almost a dead heat now. And what is she saying? If she gets in power, she's taking France out of NATO and there's going to be a complete reassessment of the whole EU deal and the whole way that they do business. Okay. 
immigration is going to be tightened up. I mean, a whole bunch of stuff. Something that wouldn't even fly with French voters three months ago is now within within the um, uh, realm of possibility. Okay. I'm not saying that she's going to win. I think Macron still sneaks out a, uh, a victory in the second round. But uh, you see where the, the trend is heading in the wrong direction. People, I've said this before, I don't believe in the end people are going to sit around and, 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 and see their standard of living be decimated and their lives turned upside down about something that is so far away from them and that uh, uh, two months ago they didn't have a clue about. And we're already seeing it in other countries outside of Europe. And I think this is coming to Europe. I don't think the Europeans or people in the United States understand what's getting ready to happen. But other people do. And this is very dangerous, okay? This is very dangerous. A lot of people are going to suffer. I mean, I'm talking about a lot of people are going to potentially starve to death. And this, this is going to be on television screens. So here we go, you know, food prices up another 13% in March. This is, uh, you know, I just showed you that, but I'd just like to show this uh, Bloomberg chart also, but, you know, it's a little bit cleaner chart. Um, and we're, there's no end in sight. This is the big jump just in the last month because of all the embargoes. You know, is anybody thinking through the knock-on effects, the second and third order effects? I don't think so. And so here's Doomberg. I mean, if you go back on Doomberg's site, I haven't went back there recently. Uh, these people wrote, it's a conglomeration of people. It's not one guy, but they wrote an article about the food supply issue over a year ago before all this other stuff happened because we were already heading for this food crisis, okay, because of the price of energy. So what does he say here? This is what I'm talking about, the inability where a lot of people are not. Um, and I don't mean this as a personal insult. You know, I was talking to... Um, uh, that one uh, interview was with Francis, I uh, can't remember his name, the Manhattan Contrarian. And the problem here is most people are busy with their lives. They don't think or understand a lot of stuff. He asked me, you know, do you speak, uh, I forget what he said, Singhalese or something like that, or do you speak uh, Hindi? I said, no. And he goes, why? Well, I have no reason to. Well, it's the same thing here. People go to the light switch, flip the light. They don't give it a second thought. The light comes on. They go to Kroger or HEB. And the, all the stuff that they wanted for groceries is there. They don't give it a second thought. And so when I, it's not an insult when I say that you're not tall enough for this ride. You just aren't tall enough. You, you don't think about it. It's not there for you to think about, but it's going to come home here now. What's he say? Energy crisis leads to a food crisis. Why? Because all you're doing with the industrial scale agriculture that we have to support the 8 billion people, it's all huge energy inputs, whether for the fertilizer mining, the nitrogen production, the tractors, the, the trucks that transport it, the trains, it's all energy based. It's not like, you know, some peasants out there with hoes, you know, and, uh, you know, toiling away. This is all industrial based, huge energy, energy equals food. So if you have an energy crisis, which we have, it leads to a food crisis, which we're entering, which leads us to social uprising, which is happening. And then it leads to collapse or worse. They say here, this is a profound statement, failing to get energy right has consequences. And so I will put a link to these videos. You can watch them, more video from Sri Lanka where the currency is collapsing and food shortages are increasing. Protesters in Sri Lanka have defied a nationwide curfew and now just broke through police barricades. So I'll put a link to that, but this is what's happening. It's not just there, um, it's in Peru. Uh, links to this uh, from Chinese media. They have a reporter out there. He's a guy from, I think, Ireland or something. But um, Peru's unrest sparked by rising prices linked to Ukraine conflict. Protests have been continuing in Lima, Ica, and other parts of Peru over rising costs of basic commodities from food to fuel. Here we go again, food and fuel. A demonstrator was shot dead during clashes with police on Wednesday. President Pedro Castillo lifted a curfew in Lima Tuesday, less than a day after issuing it to quell the unrest. And I'll put a link to that interview. It's a couple of minutes long. You can watch it. You're going to see more of this as we go through the, you know, this, this situation of fuel. You know, if you're going to cut off a major supplier of fuel, a major supplier of agricultural products and agricultural inputs from the world market, you're going to have knock-on effects. And they're starting already. 
and we haven't even got into the real shortages yet. And so we have Mr. Johnson here um, and Boris Johnson in the UK, you know, the UK being one of the biggest of the proponents and uh, antagonists of the post-World War II neoliberal rules-based world order, i.e. Davos plans, um, uniparty, uni, uni, uh, unipolar world ruled by the United States and uh, at the uh, UK and the Europeans. Uh, here's what he had to say. Excuse me. Boris Johnson has made an extraordinary admission that many UK households will be forced to make difficult choices as the cost of living takes hold. PM admits people will have to choose cheaper food, old clothes, and no heating in cost of living crisis. Now, again, um, once this happens and it starts affecting people, um, how much, if their standard of living goes down 5%, they may think all of this is worth it. If you know they're going to the, the spinning, there's a certain amount of people, like I said, that are not tall enough for the ride that will believe the propaganda from the mainstream media and the Davos place propaganda machine about in the agate prop, the agitation propaganda that this all has to do with bad Putin, bad man Russia, bad man Putin is causing your life to be bad. But mo other people will will figure this out, and will the will the will the will it be a critical mass of people to cause a political change? I suggest it will. People are not going to stand for, um, this is not what they signed on for. The, re the reason that we have governments is not to harm us deliberately, it is there to govern us and provide, you know, people look at it this way, to provide an umbrella of security, safety from foreign invaders, a judicial system to adjudicate so we don't have to resort to violence, and but if they're deliberately seen as causing hardship, they, they will throw them out. You know, my father was involved in politics going back to the 60s and 70s when he was uh, involved in that in Minnesota. And he told me a story about Hubert H. Humphrey. Most of you don't know who he is. He ran for president one time. He was a senator from Minnesota. He was a big political guy, Democratic farmer, labor guy, big uh, thing. But in the end, he said, listen, when people go to the polls, they vote their wallet. When they go in there and shut the shut the curtain, they vote their wallet. And so if people's standard of living is cut by 20, 50%, which is very possible in many of these countries, I don't think that they're going to, uh, they're going to be on board with uh, having a lower standard of living uh, over something that in their mind, they may outwardly say that they agree with, but in their mind say, this is not worth it to me. That's what I suggest. That's why I said that we're going to have unprecedented amounts of economic, social, and political upheaval. And so we have this guy. This is the guy that said history ended, right? This is one of the biggest, this Tom Friedman. He's one of the biggest proponents of the neoliberal world order. He's a tool of the Davos uh, crowd. Um, he's supposed to be one of their thinkers. I mean, this guy's a tool. Uh, basically, he's a he's a he's a hack. He's a he's a uh, 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 he's a hanger on. Uh, he, he's he's a nobody, but he is put on out there as he's some kind of big thinker. He's just a stooge of the neoliberal world order, i.e. Davos man. And so he was on CNBC the other day. Link will be in there, the video. And here's what he said. Tom Friedman says we need price controls for oil and gas that were, of course, these were a disaster in the 1970s. So let's bring that back. And I told you this was coming. You know, in a previous video, we talked about Elizabeth Warren and the Democrats pushing this. You're seeing this in other countries now come up. And this just make this is what I keep talking about, guys. These governments and these politicians and these idiots, uh, hanger ons create these problems. OK, and then they make more decisions to fix the problems they created that make the situation worse, which creates them opportunities to create more dumb decisions to fix it just keeps compounding on itself until the whole thing comes apart at the seams and people say well that's provocative john yeah you're wrong i don't agree well you don't have to agree with me this is did price controls work in the 70s because i went back and looked at it it didn't work what it leads to is less production of the goods that you want the price signals if you leave the free market alone if oil prices go up it will do two things it will cause frivolous use of the fuel to be go away, it will cause people to be more efficient with the use of the fuel. So then you will have a demand response. Demand will start to come down. 
And then you will also get a supply response. It sends signals to producers, to investors, to capital, people with capital to allocate capital because the margins and the profit potential is so high. And eventually you get a, re a supply response in combination with the demand destruction and then prices come down. But we're not gonna do that because Thomas Friedman knows better because he's a great thinker. But here's what he said, quote, but what we really need, Becky, he's talking to Becky Quick on CNBC, would be an oil import tax that would basically set a price of oil in America at a price that would be stable and predictable for American oil producers to make a profit, to consistently drill something like in the range of 50 or 60. Now, let me, let me pause here. How does Thomas Friedman, he hasn't drilled an oil well, he doesn't know a darn thing about the oil industry or energy anything. He's just a stooge. How does he know that uh, Vicki Holub at Occidental, that 50 or 60 is going to give her, uh, encourage her to make the decision in that board there to drill more wells? You see what I'm saying? This is just central planning and I'm so smart. I can move the levers and turn the dials because I'm so smart and educated and we can fix this because we're smart. We can dictate to better than the market. You see, where, you see how this works? This is Goss plan 2.0. So this is this is Soviet type thinking, collectivist thinking. OK, I'm so smart and educated. We're the upper elite crust and we can pull the levers and turn the knobs and make everything right again. This is very dangerous thinking. So let me continue. And if it ever fell below that, you tax it up. That's what we need to have, a stable supply of oil at a reasonable price point. Well, the only way you're going to get stable oil supply at a reasonable price point is to quit putting legislation in place and over-regulating an industry that, is, can, that, that was able to single-handedly bring the price of oil down. You know, when this administration took off as gasoline was under, a, uh, under $2 a gallon, it was like a buck 86. Now it's four bucks here in Texas, and it's way above that in many other states. Diesel, you have a diesel shortage around the world right now. You have natural gas over $6 in MCF. No one's even talking about that, okay? Why? Because we won't let, you know, you have a disparity where you have the uh, Appalachia gas basin there in the uh, mid-Atlantic, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and gas prices, they had at one time an overabundance of gas. And then you have in New England, gas prices where they're having to bring LNG in because these governments won't allow pipelines to be built from where the gas is to where the gas is needed. This is what the regulators did. It's not the industry can't fix the problem. You won't let them fix the problem, but you're going to come up with concoct some scheme of price controls and taxing that somehow, like I said, you're going to turn the dials and move the levers and, 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 and behind the screen there and you know how to do it. It's ridiculous. Does anybody actually think that's listening to this that that's going to work? So what does Becky Quick say? Whoa, we're talking price controls. This was not what I expected to hear from you, Tom, because price controls, you take me back to the 70s and you worry me a little bit with what we've seen before. Yeah, you should be worried because that's exactly what will happen. Price controls lead to sh more shortages. That's what they lead to. This is economics 101. This is macroeconomics 101. It's like first year course that you take when you go to college. But yet, that's what we're going to try, I guess. And we're going to tax and we're going to demonize these industries that provide resources that we need to live the lifestyle that most people want to live, quite frankly. Nobody wants to live in deprivation or poverty or shortages, um, I, certainly not in the United States. That's just a fact. I will bet, I'll, I'll bet all my money on that. There will be political change before this gets too bad. It just will not be allowed. So I want to talk about uranium this week. Um, I haven't talked about uranium a lot. I'm not going to, I was interesting, Jared Dillon, who writes the Daily Dirt Nap, um, he had an interesting tweet this week. I didn't want to put it up and I won't repeat it, but he said, you know, one thing he had a problem with the uranium trade because, you know, it's full of so many like grifters and a-hole. He used the word, a well, I'm not going to, I don't want to try to use the language, but uh, you should try to look up the tweet. And, uh, but, you know, got a big response because, you know, like I said earlier, you know, three, four years ago, the only people talking about uranium were a few people, including myself, and nobody else was talking about it. Now we have a lot of people, which is fine. I'm, I'm not going to criticize anybody. Um, people have turned it into great businesses, great analysts out there, great uh, uh, interaction. But I, I just don't talk about it anymore because 
I, I made my thesis in investment case for uranium two years ago. Uh, and, you know, I bought my shares and I sit here. And so uh, there's really nothing more to talk about except for wait for it to play out, which it is currently doing. Um, obviously being exacerbated by now um, a view that with two things really, you know, the Sprott entity that's sucking up all the uranium. And what I would suggest you do, I'll put a link in the, uh, I think I did this before, but Harris Kufferman, AKA Cuppy, he wrote um, an article recently about this and he referenced when he made a similar call around uh, when the uh, Grayscale Bitcoin Trust was um, doing something similar, hoovering up Bitcoin and it caused a big, um, big bullish push tailwind, if you will, behind the Bitcoin um, uh, bull market that we had, you know, a couple of years ago or up to a year ago. And uh, something similar now is happening here. Right? You have this buyer that's in the market constantly buying uh, where there's limited supply. And now you throw on the fact that we're going to have possibly embargoes. And you also layer all of that on, you know, the Russian uranium, we're going to have embargoes possibly. And so now you layer on top of that, the fact that the utilities are behind the power curve on uh, buying, you know, the uranium they need for their reactor. So I, all of the bullish thesis that we had is all coming together. And so I just wanted to throw this chart up here. You know, back in the summer, we had this big move in uranium prices and we had a lot of tourists come in and we had a lot of action. And there was a lot of talk uh, on uh, Twitter. And then we inevitably, it was extremely overbought. I don't show all the RSIs and all the movie. You know, I just show you the moving averages here, but this is what we want to see, right? This is a continuous bull market. It's very volatile, as I said it would be. You know, we got as high as 1850. Uh, I think um, this is, like I said, this is a Sprott Trust, basically, for physical uranium. And then, you know, we pulled all the way back to like 13, you know, 12 and a half dollars, right? Because, you know, all everybody's in at that point and then you have a you know pullback as the tourists leave and it peaks out you know and it consolidated for you know six months and then you know kind of bottom and then you have this little wedge and it broke out again and so we're heading back you know up for another bull leg so um we are in a as i said before uranium bull market this looks like another up leg going up you know, as long as that uh, moves from the lower left to the upper right and the 50 day stays above the 200 day, I'm comfortable. We're in a, we're in a continuing bull market. So again, you start seeing all the people start ramping up the tweets on Uranium Twitter, which is fine. But, you know, some of this has to be looked at as for sentiment, you know, how much bullish sentiments there. And, uh, but still a lot of opportunity here, right? I've been buying the physical trust. Um, I have funds that I wanted to put to work in the market, you know, with with 8% inflation, you can't just have your money in the bank, you're losing purchasing power. And so this is something I think that um, even in a um, normal bear market that we may be heading towards, I mean, I don't, I'm not a market forecaster, but I think you have so many tailwinds here, I think you can hide out here. Yes, in a general stock market decline, uh, everything's going to go down, but this probably goes down less and then goes back up sooner and faster. Why? Because uh, the, the, the necessity of this resource um, is still there regardless. The nuclear reactors will not shut down if we have a recession. They still require. So you'll have a lot of volatility. As I said before, you can see the volatility in this chart that just goes back to um, May of last year. Look at the volatility in this thing. You know, from 10, from a low of 10 down here, in August of last year to a high of, um, you basically had an 80% run in this, in this uh, vehicle. In, and when you see these gaps, runaway gaps like this, you know uh, what's happening. And then a pullback and consolidation, but you know, this is still a bull market. And if you, you know, if you bought back in here, you know, you're just riding this thing. And of course the, the stocks do respond to this too. We're seeing the uh, stocks move up and, um, respond to this. And, you know, I, I'm not going to get into the you have companies in the portfolio have done very well. I still think, you know, you're not going to get the 20 baggers now, but there's still opportunities, I think, for five and 10 baggers. And I don't know how high this thing goes, right? Does it go to 100? I think eventually the price of uranium is going to exceed the old highs, which would put it over $200 a pound. 
from the last bull market. And I don't know what the time frame of that would be in the next couple of years. I don't know, but I do think we're heading in that direction. And so we had uh, more uranium news. I mean, in the UK, they announced that they are going to, I think, build 50 gigawatts of nuclear going forward. So some countries are getting it, right? It's amazing to me that the Germans are still reluctant um, to reverse their decision on the closing of the nuclear power plants in Germany, especially with the, I mean, this, I don't want to offend German people, but when I look at this, this is just dumb decision making. If you're going to have this economic war against Russia and try to force them out, and you're going to self immolate yourself to do that, you're not going to get points for that in the election. You know, Olaf Scholz is a very weak leader. The Greens don't really have a plan. They're in power. And these people typically are very good at agitating and protesting and advocating and, do, and, and, and doing that, but they're usually not very good at governing. You know, there's no you know, I do not think that Angela Merkel will be making the decisions that these people are making or previous other chancellors, but we have weak leadership. We have pygmies in Europe. And so um, we're seeing a difference here in some other countries. Like I said, um, people that are getting it right. If you're not going to, uh, if you're going to have one of the largest industrial countries in the world, Germany, it requires tremendous energy inputs. And if you're going to self embargo yourself from, from your main supplier, it's not going to turn out well. So at least in the UK, we're seeing this. And then here in the United States, Governor Joe Manchin, West Virginia, um, introduces legisla legislation to boost US uranium production. It's from Bloomberg, Manchin bill would boost US uranium production, reduce imports. You know, we import just about all of our uranium fuel here. You know, in the United States, 20% of the electricity, baseload electricity is produced by nuclear power. Most people don't know that. And it's not uh, good strategically that we have 20% of our base load is nuclear power, which is not going to go away anytime soon. And we don't control the fuel supply. That's, that's just dumb. It's stupid. So hopefully that started to change under the Trump administration. And now it looks like, um, you know, we have uh, opportunity here for uh, legislation. It says, you know, the U.S. would be required to increase its uranium enrichment capabilities through a, you know, and why? Because the Russians control 50% of the world's nuclear enrichment. I mean, if you dig yellow cake out of the ground, it still has to be enriched, okay, before it can be turned into fuel. And we don't have that ability here in the US. The Russians control a lot of this. Uh, and so just cutting it off is not something you can do immediately. And how long does it take to build an enrichment facility? More than a year, I guarantee it. And so, a uh, nuclear fuel security program that seeks to reduce imports from Russia and China. The bill would authorize funds to increase both production of low enriched uranium and high assay low enriched uranium used in nuclear reactors and create a national strategic uranium reserve program to ensure supply of domestically produced and converted uranium. Legislation would also boost civilian nuclear exports through expansion of export import bank and other means according to summary. So this is just been introduced it will take years to do this but at least you know this is just more bullish news you know like i said we have massive tailwinds behind us in this uranium sector that's already basically put a lot of people in positions where they could retire and i think this is going to get a lot more bullish over time and and, and lead to uh much higher prices and much more um uh, wealth creation so this is the uh, North Shore Global Uranium Mining ETF, URNN. I've talked about it before. If you are just going to be a passive investor, if you say, hey, you know what, John, I get it. I agree with you. Uranium is going to go higher, uh, but I don't really have the time to research uh, individual uranium stocks, nor do I have the desire. Um, you could just buy the URNM uh, ETF. And so what's interesting about this and why I think this is another catalyst or another you know, tailwind for us is that... Uh, Sprott Asset Management, which runs the Sprott Uranium Trust, which is the physical uranium, they came in and said that they wanted to take over the North Shore Global Uranium ETF and convert it into the Sprott Uranium Miners ETF. Why is this important? Because Sprott Asset Management is a is a asset management company that um, basically is a marketing genius around natural resources. They have an extensive customer list. And so now when this thing gets turned into um, the Sprott 
uh, uranium miners ETF, they, their marketing department, they'll, that's why I put here, Sprott, do what you do best, which is market these things. And so this could be part of increasing the speed of the flywheel, if you will. What do I mean? They will go out to their high net worth people, their institutional investors, make the case for uranium, for nuclear power, uh, how uh, this the investment case, and then money will come in, right? So this is such a small market as additional funds, as that institutional, as that high net worth money begins to come in uh, and take over the baton from retail, we're going to see the next leg higher in uh, these stocks and in the uranium price, right? Because um, URNM also holds the Sprott Trust uh, for the uranium, physical uranium, and so it's just another bullish tailwind, right? Um, these guys did a good good thing starting this uh, fund, this ETF, um, and, and creating the index. But you know, I don't think that they had the same type of marketing chops that Sprott does. Sprott's no name. They have a Rolodex. They've got a list, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. They've got. They know who all the high net worth people are. They're going to take this thing on the road and be um, marketing it, right? Because what's their business model? Get assets under management and cream off fees, right? And this does have a good, the, the uranium story is a good story and it will sell. And so um, expect that this is just another tailwind uh, for a positive uranium story, which, uh, you know, continues. So real quick, this is dragging out a little bit, uh, but I want to talk about this offshore exploration and production spending up 20% plus in 2022. Um, offshore spending expected to be up 20%. So we're seeing it, right? It's a higher oil price. And why do I want to talk about this? Because uh, people have asked me, well, all these other things that you've talked about have moved quite a bit. What still hasn't moved, folks, is, is oil field services. It's starting to move. The breakouts are starting to happen in a lot of the stocks. Um, offshore oil uh, and oil services in general, uh, there's a lot of great names there and they're breaking out. And uh, where we are with the oil field services stocks is way below where they have traded in the past at these type of oil levels. So we could you could just go out and buy, like I said, the uh, OIH, which is the um, oil field services ETF. And that thing at this current oil price at 100 bucks a barrel WTI should be trading, you know, twice or three times, you know, two, two, at least twice what it is now. So uh, in the individual stocks, like in the newsletter, we've got into some Canadian junior companies that we think can do well, uh, that are starting to see their businesses recover. Uh, and uh, we think that there's, you know, some possible five or 10 baggers there. Uh, but uh, this is a sector that has now getting attention, is starting to get capital to come in, it is entering its up cycle and it hasn't been necessarily fully recognized by the market. So I think there's an opportunity there for uh, speculation and, 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 uh, over the next few years. It's starting to happen, right? So you're already, uh, this is Pareto Securities, they already had like a 10 or 15% increase booked for 2022, but it looks like it's going to be 20%. So major spending got it up 21%. Um, so they just give some examples, Ramco budget up 40% year over year, E9, which is an Italian, uh, very large Italian integrated company, 10% uh, above stated long-term budget, um, Petrobras, Petrobras, which is a state-owned Brazilian oil company up 14% year over year. So you're seeing the money start to come in, right? And what I've said before about the oil field services company, it went through the wor or oil field services industry, it went through the worst depression it ever went through in the history of the industry. And so it's atrophied, okay? It's like if you just laid in bed for a year and didn't do any exercise and then tried to get up and, you know, it's gonna take a while to build your muscles up, right? And if you were just asked to get out of, you know, traction or something after a motorcycle accident, then go run a marathon, you can't do it, okay? You, you have to build it up. So you're gonna have a lot of money coming at an industry that's been really consolidated. And that should lead to, well, it's already leading to issues around labor and parts and stuff like that. But that stuff gets rectified usually. And there's going to be tremendous margin. I'm, what I'm hoping to see over the next couple of quarters is get through some of these supply issues and labor issues and then see some massive margin expansion. So uh, remains to be seen. But uh, I do think there's an opportunity there still. And so here we go. You know, as cash flow goes up for these... Um, uh, major offshore focused EMPs, you're starting to see the trend. As you can see, they've got it broken down from dividends, buybacks, 
and of course capex and you're seeing that trend go up as the cash flow goes up the capex goes up okay so we're starting to see it new debt net debt now down below pre-covid levels growth investors are long gone for the industry with high focus on shareholder distributions continued shareholder pressure to adapt to new to net zero scenarios, particularly for political oil majors. So um, I, I do think that, you know, we will see eventually, we are starting to see the increase in CapEx and it will continue. It probably won't be as massive, but, you know, if we have oil prices stand up here, the confidence builds, right? Quarter after quarter, if prices stay up and the projects look good, then people will start bringing it to the board because remember, these are depleting industries. You have to replace the production that you produced. And so that will lead, you know, eventually we will get into a, you know, full-blown bull market in this. And I don't know when that is, but this is the time to be positioning. I've already talked about like a year ago, I was positioning. So this is the time to position in a lot of these companies. All right, that's it for this week, guys. Uh, appreciate the um, support and uh, look forward to the feedback. Uh, it's usually pretty good. And if you are interested in the Actionable Intelligence alert newsletter, a lot of people will put in the comments, how do I subscribe? Everything is in the show notes. Just look below the video. You can go in the show notes. If you're interested in um, just a sample of my work, you can become a Patreon. And for $5 a month, I will give you the last current pick that we put into the newsletter. That's a one-shot deal. Let me specify that because people don't seem to understand that. You don't sign up for Patreon, then every month I give you a pick. You get it one pick. One, the last one that we did for the newsletter, that's what you get as a sample. You can continue to become a Patreon because some people like to do that because they like the work that we do even here and they want to support us or you can cancel it. But that $5 is going to get you one pick. If you do a minimum of $5 a month, you can do $20 a month. You're not going to get any more picks. So just recognize that. And like I said, uh, I think, uh, like I said, last week we did the first quarter, we were up pretty good. We crushed the S and P. Um, and I think that, uh, we're going to see a lot, uh, a further upward momentum in a lot of these commodities. I think we're heading for a blow off in a lot of these commodities or resources it remains to be seen. But if you want to take advantage of that or get some more in-depth analysis and specific names, that's in the newsletter. All right, guys, thanks a lot. And uh, we'll talk to you next week.